hi folks, welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Paul Fremantle. Uh, as you might guess, I'm at home. No surprises there. Uh, and I hope you um, enjoy today's session, which I'll be talking about federated APIs across ecosystems. So uh, some of you may have seen some of my presentations before. Uh, and if you have, um, you, you will know that I, I like biological metaphors. So this is uh, me uh, a few years ago. Uh, I thought that was quite funny with a big pull sign. And um, I've been working open source for a long time. Uh, I spent roughly 10 years at IBM where I was a, ended up as a senior technical staff member in charge of a product called the Web Services Gateway. And um, uh, started WSO2 nearly 15 years ago. And um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to love maths, and I, well, I still love maths. I think maths is fantastic. Ah, so sorry, I turned. Thank you for somebody. I there we go. So there's uh, there's me. Sorry, I wasn't. I had the the slides weren't weren't moving forward. So, uh, and I love maths, and and if you're a mathematician, this is a particularly great. Uh, formula, it encapsulates all the major concepts of math in one very simple uh, truth. Uh, and well, not all the concepts, but a, a significant number of them, imaginary numbers, pi, logarithms, one, zero, addition, equality. It's pretty, pretty fantastic. And, and one of the things I think so, so attractive about this is how simple it is. The, the fact you can reduce some of these concepts to such simplicity is, is, is really powerful. And in physics, you get even more reduction. You get this, you know, E equals MC squared. This wasn't uh, Einstein's first view of this. He actually started out with a, a slightly more complex equation. He managed to simplify it down to this. Uh, and that's amazing, isn't it? That you can capture mass, energy, and the speed of light in such a simple equation. And then we get biology, and, and I was not a big fan of biology as a teenager, and uh, to be honest, I dropped it as soon as I could, which I now regret. But this is a biological equation uh, showing uh, mutation of, of genetic material, and as you can see, it's really, really scary, I think is the best word. It's, it's, it's complex, it's, it's difficult, uh, and it doesn't seem to simplify things, it seems to complexify things, and, and I think that was what put me off biology. But if you think about it, biology is fundamentally the study of complex systems. And, and I think that in our world of dealing with digital transformation, enterprise integration, APIs, large enterprises, ecosystems of, of com competing and collaborating companies, taking inspiration from biology is I think really important because we are trying to deal with complex systems and, and trying to simplify them is not always valid. And so today I'm really going to be thinking about ecosystems and how APIs can form together in ecosystems, both within organizations and across organizations. And ecosystems are interesting. The definition of an ecosystem is the biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So in other words, it's the combination of the world you live in and the different active participants in that world. And I think that's a very powerful metaphor for what we're doing with APIs and API Federation. And so that's really going to be the basis for today's talk. And I wanna start out by uh, highlighting this fact, and I, I, I'm not the only person to say this, but. I think APIs are the products of the 21st century. So for example, here we are uh, doing an online webinar. Many of you are sat at home in, in lockdown and, and able to watch this. Uh, and these kind of webinar systems are all based on APIs. The integration between the calendar and the API and the webinar system was done through an API so that you could have a calendar entry in your in your thing. You know, if this was a physical conference we were at, many of you might have used Uber to get there, which is 
putting APIs on top of the physical world. So we see both digital only products and the combination of digital and real world products coming together through APIs. And I want to take go back and look at, at the evolution of ordinary products. And what we saw in the 19th century was the change from these kind of products, sort of slightly different, homemade, delicious, but but not all identical, to these sort of products where we saw a, a quality control, uh, reproducibility, you know, look, there's one biscuit there that wasn't quite good enough, and he's put it on the side. Um, to, because it wasn't exactly identical to all the other biscuits that were that were being made in that factory. And these concepts are, are very important to, to the products of today, that they are reproducible, fungible, and reliable. Fungible is an interesting word. What fungible means is that you can swap one for another. So, for example, if I have one packet of biscuits that's unopened and another packet of biscuits that are unopened, I shouldn't care which one I have. And I can move them around, I can buy them, I can, for instance, buy them online and not care to look at them because they're they're identical. Whereas if it was a non-fungible product, uh, I'd really like to go and see it myself before I pay for it. And so these concepts are, are really important, again, to digital systems and so this is going to be a big big thing of what i'm talking about here is the ability to make apis fungible and when things are fungible they can be resold uh redistributed uh, and this is a big part of fit the federation model that i'm going to talk about but i want to go even further back in time and look at uh these guys and these guys were the sort of product distribution network of the uh, before common era of the of the ancient Mediterranean, and they were the Phoenicians. And what the Phoenicians did was to create a commercial network across the whole of the Mediterranean, and they would buy goods from one group and transport them and sell them to a different group. They were the middlemen, the traders of the ancient world, and that's a really important point when it comes to APIs and digital products, because at the moment, what we see is that most APIs today are direct from the producer to the consumer. So for example, you know, if you use eBay's API, you're typically using it directly yourself. If you use PayPal, you're typically using it directly. Um, and, and to do that, you sign up onto the PayPal or eBay developer website, you get a key, you build an app, and that app talks directly to those APIs. But not all APIs are direct from producer to consumer. We get to see this bifurcation, this branching, this reuse in some interesting examples. One of those is a API marketplace for mobile apps called IdeaBiz, which uh, basically created a environment for sharing of revenue so this is a app store for apis so the apple app store or the google app store let you publish apps in a shared store and share in the revenue with apple and google idea biz lets you publish apis in an api store where lots of developers congregate and this onboarded two and a half thousand developers in just 18 months to create three and a half thousand APIs. So that's a, an interesting model where we start to see the multiple parties pulling together APIs into a single place. And, and that's a kind of federation. And later in this talk, I'm going to talk about the five different types of federation that uh, we've identified so far, which I think you will find interesting. So another kind of federation that we've seen is this uh, API hub in the telco industry. So this is a hub in, uh, in the 
Far East that takes APIs from different providers and bundles them together. So the thin lines on the left-hand side are individual APIs and they get bundled together and resold to cellular operators to build mobile apps from. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that this is basically another revenue share model. So the cell operator pays for the bundle, the hub operator takes that revenue and redistributes it to the API operators, but also keeps some themselves for reselling it. So this is the kind of thing that the Phoenicians were doing. They were taking products from different parties and redistributing them and selling them uh, in different places and taking a cut of that uh, margin of that cell as they went forward. But here is how this is starting to, to evolve and become even more like the Phoenicians. So that hub in Southeast Asia uh, is creating these bundles of APIs and a different hub in the Middle East uh, is, is interested in buying them and reselling them to cellular operators in the Middle East. And so what you would see in this model is you'd see a three-way revenue share. The cell operator in the Middle East gives money to the Middle East hub, who gives, takes a share, passes it to the Southeast Asia hub, who then redistributes most of that back to the API providers, but keeps a margin as well. And so this really is like the Phoenicians, because we're seeing these APIs being taken and redistributed across the world uh, to new markets to gain higher traction than they would in their own environment. Uh, and this is really starting to see the federation of APIs, as I would describe it. And one of the key aspects of federating APIs is the concept of an API marketplace. And I distinguish between a portal and a marketplace in the sense that I consider an API portal to be a single uh, organization's APIs. So, for example, if you go to developer.stubhub.com, you get to see StubHub's APIs in a single place. But an API marketplace allows you to take APIs from multiple different providers and organizations and to publish them in a shared environment where they may be composed, there may be API products, but you get the, all these different people working together. And that's more like the idea hub. Uh, IdeaBiz API portal I showed you earlier, which is really a true marketplace. Another example of a portal that is becoming a marketplace is BNY Mellon Nexen. So BNY Mellon, uh, Bank of New York Mellon, is one of the world's biggest asset management banks. And what does that mean? That means that they look after and manage stock shares uh, options and other derivatives and, and uh, types of asset on behalf of different companies. So they look after, um, you know, the stocks and shares on behalf of pension funds, on behalf of companies, uh, and they have thousands of customers who need to be able to come and manage their assets and 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 get information about them. And so. They, about five or six years ago, started the journey to unify all of that asset management, all that communication through a single API portal called Nextend. Before that, they had all kinds of different ways, FTPs, uh, file transfer, SOAP messages, all kinds of different ways that you could get information about your assets that they were managing on your behalf. Uh, and they unified all of those into a, a single portal. Uh, and they managed $33 trillion of assets, which is frankly astounding and, and, and blows my mind. I mean, that's, that's the GDP of a, of a country. So that is a crazy amount of assets that they are managing. And they are helping to do all of this through this API portal. So this is APIs are absolutely essential to their business now. And what Jonathan Pearl, who's the director of Nexen, said is that they're beginning to enable 
their partners to deploy APIs and API products into that portal. So that portal is becoming a marketplace. And, and the really interesting thing that Jonathan said was we want to blur the lines between our technology and our customers. So what does that mean? That means really creating an ecosystem. It means creating a single unified set of technologies that crosses different organizations. And it's not just a one way street. It's a, it's a multi-part, it's a mesh where different parties all contribute to the, to the benefit. That is fundamentally an ecosystem. And I think that's very exciting that one of the leading asset management banks in the world has really identified that ecosystems are essential to their future. But I also want to talk about APIs inside an organization as well as externally. And I think this is really important. And I think the concept of ecosystems actually applies just as much inside organizations as outside organizations. So far, we've been talking about API federation, ecosystems and marketplaces across different organizations. But what, why is it important inside an organization? So let's go back to the Agile Manifesto. The Agile Manifesto says the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. So what's a self-organizing team? A self-organizing team is one that decides how it's going to solve problems themselves. It uh, comes up with its own measures. It comes up with its own education plans. They, they really work as a small team effectively together to solve problems. And here's another example of self-organization from nature. So the patterns on the back of this beautiful butterfly emerge in a self-organizing way. So each of the cells that makes up the, the, the colors on the back of this butterfly are the same. They start out the same and somehow they self-organize into, into these beautiful patterns, which give this butterfly a biological advantage through evolution. And uh, we are seeing uh, the, the massive growth of self-organizing agile teams building microservices. And here's a simple example. Uber, back in 2016, uh, said that they'd started to move to a microservices architecture. And they had built several hundred uh, microservices in a variety of languages with different frameworks back in 2016. In 2019, uh, they published this picture at a conference of their microservice graph. And as you can see, it has grown to several thousand uh, microservices and a huge amount of interconnectedness. This is really an ecosystem. And, and you might think, well, hey, Paul, you, you like ecosystems. You'd love this. And, and I'm not, so, so I want to be absolutely clear, I'm not uh, making any comment about Uber's organization of their microservices because I'm not involved in it. I don't know how they've done this. But if I saw this picture, would I think this was a good ecosystem arrangement? I, I would be scared by this picture. And I'm scared not by the number of dots on it, not by the number of microservices, but by the number of lines, the massive interconnectedness of these different components. I think that what we're looking for in API and microservice ecosystems is some clarity, some simplicity. And this really comes down to building teams that have can be effective working. And there's some very interesting research from Wharton Business School that shows that as soon as a team gets to even, even a medium size, even beyond 10 people, uh, the efficiency of that team drops off very rapidly. And there's one key phrase in this paper which really explains this, which is called relational loss, which is that as we get beyond a handful of people in a team, we don't know those other people 
and we can't trust them as well and this leads to less efficiency as a team so we need small teams we need two pizza teams and then as soon as we get those two pizza teams those small teams we somehow end up with this challenge conway's law says that organizations which design systems that are constrained are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations uh, and he said this back in 1967 and i first came across this uh, idea back in the late 80s when i was working for ibm as a student and and i came across this and, and i was pretty blown away because this was uh, this was seemed to me a real challenge and, and i think it's better put by eric raymond in the cathedral in the bazaar which says if you have four groups working on a compiler you end up with a four pass compiler so in other words you split your teams into these small groups these two pizza teams to be more effective and then you end up with a technology that mirrors those groups and as a as a young uh, as a young guy doing my first job I had this kind of uh, slightly arrogant technical view that this was all the problem of bad management. Managers were just idiots uh, and techies were brilliant. And if only the managers uh, could sort this out, we'd be fine. And now, unfortunately, I'm a manager uh, and maybe I'm less arrogant or maybe I'm just uh, scared. But the fact is that I realize that you can't fight human nature so what we need to do is we need to somehow build the right boundaries we need to build the right technical structure uh, so that the teams we have give us the technical structure we want in other words we want to we want to organize the teams and the technical structure in harmony together so we want to build a a system where where we accept Conway's law, we understand it's a, it's a fixed, uh, a piece of human nature, uh, an axiom almost, and therefore we organize around it. And so to do that, we need to give these self-organizing teams the boundaries so they can be effective. And this is where I also take some inspiration from biology. And the inspiration for, for this piece of thinking is is cells so these are cells and when you look at cells uh, here the first thing you notice are the boundaries and the boundaries are kind of the cell walls are kind of what stops us all just being a big pile of a big puddle of goo on the floor because we have these cell walls that create structure those structures create all of human life and the cell is the is the basic unit of both you know, flora and fauna. So in other words, of, of all plant life and all animal life. So all living organisms are structured into cells. And the, the cell concept is, is very similar. The idea of having a, a boundary is very similar to a concept from domain-driven design uh, that Eric Evans put out in his blue book uh, back in the 90s and he had this concept that we needed to have this this thing called a bounded context and a bounded context is where we have different teams working on different parts of a large OO program and we use certain objects as the as the as the boundaries between those different teams and he also has the concept of an aggregate, which is where you pull together several classes and you aggregate them into a single uh, unit and you put a, a, a context around that. And these two concepts have driven a, a sort of a, a new, well, uh, it's not really new, it's, it's really a kind of a retelling of that, those, those key concepts for the microservices world, which is what we call a cell-based reference architecture. And this is something that uh, Asanka and I have worked on. And you can find it on GitHub. It's published under Creative Commons license. And we really welcome pull requests and contribution uh, or even criticism. If you think this is wrong, please tell us. We'd really like to, to know it, why and improve it. So this is really saying 
that we need to put a technical infrastructure, which we call cells, around the that is in line with the team infrastructure. And the one way to think of this is to look at what actually happens at the boundary of a cell in a biological uh, situation, which is that you have these things called transmembrane receptors and signaling. So what you have is that at the cell wall, there are these receptors. So on the outside is, which is the above the cell wall here, we get certain uh, proteins and enzymes uh, and, and coming along and uh, attaching to the receptor of the cell. And then there's a signaling system that brings that into the cell. And then we get another chemical reaction inside the cell, which uh, affects it. And I, I don't I don't mean to bring this back to coronavirus, but right now we're all very aware of this because the coronavirus has certain proteins on the outside which attach to a particular type of receptor called ACE2. And that's really what's been uh, driving the, what's going on with coronavirus. They're basically hacking the, the cell membrane of a certain type of cell inside our body. But what does this look like to me? This looks like an event-driven architecture with a uh, API micro gateway. So you can think of these chemicals on the outside of the cell as flowing along in the intracellular situation. And these chemicals come along and, and they are like events. And certain events are passed through the API micro gateway to cause an event to happen inside the cell. And so this is really how we uh, recommend to, to people that they build these cell constructs inside their organization is that you put a, a set of microservices that work together in a bounded context into a, say, a Kubernetes pod or into a namespace, and you put an API micro gateway in front of it to protect that, uh, to protect that cell from the rest of the world and to give it a clear boundary. So in other words, it only responds to certain interactions and it ignores all the other ones, which is just what happens with a cell. So we see cells as the building block of a composable enterprise. So you have these self-contained deployable units with a gateway that create these APIs within an organization. And then you need to say, well, okay, I've got all these APIs within an organization. How do I create business products? How do I create real usage across them? How do I create external APIs across these? And fundamentally, that is a federation story. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. And, and that's I, I, part of this idea that we have of a reference methodology for agility, which is a another paper we've written. And Asanka really led this work. And, and what this is all about is building a uh, a story about how you can move from being a, a, a monolithic organization through being an API-driven organization into an integration agile organization and looking at the people, the processes, and the technology all the way through and trying to see how these different uh, steps happen inside organizations to take them to be more digitally aligned. And a big part of this I think is the concept of product management. Because if APIs are the products of the 21st century, then they need product management. And I've spent a lot of my uh, career uh, working in software development and really working on product management. And, and so for me, I can really see how these concepts of product management apply to the API world. This is a new book that's just come out. Um, which really tries to look at how you apply product management uh, to external APIs. And there are multiple aspects of product management. So there's things about being a subject expert, so really understanding the domain you're working in. There are aspects of being a marketer and a growth hacker. How do you scale up your product? How do you then retain users and evolve the, the product without 
upsetting happy users? And then how do you deal with the end of life of a product? How do you manage it as as the demand grows off? And, and how do you find new products to replace it? So these concepts of product management, I think, are really essential. And one company that I feel has really taken this on board for their API story is Cerner. So Cerner is a very, very large healthcare technology company based in the USA. And they have uh, done an amazing job of building an API ecosystem inside the organization of building a decentralized API model where multiple parties can publish APIs inside a central API marketplace, but in a, in a very decentralized and, and self-ownership kind of way. And as part of that, they've really tried to bring the concepts of product management to play in the learning, in the how you educate and evolve your teams to understand the, the benefits of a marketplace, the benefits of an ecosystem in building out your, your API story inside an organization. And the learning I take away from that is that the interface to a cell needs to be treated as a product. So in other words, we are, as soon as we have a boundary between teams, we need to start thinking about how we have a product. And this is not just a technical API that someone's calling, it's, it's, there's a human interaction, there's product management, there's versioning, there's documentation, there's how do I apply those product management concepts of growth hacking, understanding my market, all the way through to deprecation, uh, to this interface, because I'm working with other teams at this point. So let's go back to our history of products, right? So, so we started out talking about the Phoenicians and how they were transferring products around the world. And then we talked about how the Industrial Revolution made products much more replicable, reproducible, fungible, and identical. And then in the 20th century, the huge change in the product world was this concept of an integrated supply chain. So we started to see people doing supply chain management, product lifecycle management, logistics management, just-in-time supply, and then pulling this all together with enterprise resource planning, financial modeling, and systems that pull together all of these aspects into a single flow. So what, what does that say to the API world? Well, what that says to me in the API world is that we need an integrated supply chain for APIs. We need an API supply chain. So what does that mean? That means we need to be able to take legacy integration. We need to be able to take our legacy systems and build them into APIs. We need to be able to manage and pull together APIs from across multiple self-organizing teams, but also across different organizations. So we want to have federated APIs across clouds and microservices. We want to pull those together into API product management, into API products that we sell, that we uh, monetize. And then, of course, we need analytics and monetization. We need the financials behind all of this so that we can monitor it all. And this is really talking about needing a, a kind of a consistent vision across your API landscape, across the technical API landscape that you have inside your organization, across those microservices, across the business APIs that you offer to third parties that you sell. And this is actually very similar to what uh, Bank of New York Mellon has done. They started out by pulling APIs from together internally into an internal API portal. And then they uh, used API product management concepts to take those APIs and, and publish them out to party third parties. And now they're really bringing in the federation by pulling in third party APIs into their portal. And, and of course, they're using analytics and monetization concepts across all of this. So that really brings me to these five patterns that we've identified for API federation. And we've already come across some of these. So this is really a kind of summary of, of what we've seen and discussed throughout this, this webinar. So the first pattern 
is really an internal API marketplace. And what I mean by an internal API marketplace as opposed to an internal API portal is that there needs to be some level of independence between the teams here. So in other words, we have these different teams, these different cells, as it were, producing APIs inside an organization, but they need some independence in publishing them. Uh, this is not, does, this should not be a centralized infrastructure. If they're self-organizing teams, then it should be up to them what APIs they publish and how they publish them. Now, you may of course have best practices and, and guidelines and policy validation to check that these APIs fit into the, the, the internal quality control. But this, this should really be have some, some, some sort of marketplace construct of, of believing these independent organizations. And one organization where I've seen this happening is Scania. So Scania uh, is, is, a, is a very large manufacturer of, of uh, industrial vehicles. And they have uh, many, many internal legacy applications. Uh, and they had taken a, a sort of center of excellence approach to building their integration across those applications. And, and what they've really discovered is that that doesn't scale to their needs. And so they want to take a much more marketplace approach to integration to say it's up to each group to publish standardized APIs in a marketplace and to manage those as products and to support other teams to use those in a much more decentralized way. And so the center of excellence who were doing all the integration before now really focus on best practices on managing that marketplace and on helping teams become more self-organized and more self-enabled. So the second pattern for federation that we've seen is this partner marketplace. So this is where you see some APIs from the organization itself but we start to see partners also publishing APIs into that. So I'm showing, uh, and this is really, you know, the, the prime example of this is Bank of New York Mellon, where the blue APIs are those provided by the Bank of New York Mellon, and then the red APIs are those provided by their partners. The third pattern that I've started to see is what you might call a closed group API marketplace. So this is where you see multiple uh, organizations publishing APIs into a single marketplace, but it's not a free-for-all, it's not a wide open uh, organization. What this is really trying to do is to say that there's a set of companies or organizations that work together to produce this set of APIs. And you can think of open banking as a really good example of this, where there are there is a single directory, for example, in the UK, of all the people of all the banks that are offering open banking interfaces. Everybody publishes their systems in there, but they're all independent. Another example of this is in governments. So many governments are trying to encourage their departments to publish APIs in a unified marketplace. But when you think about it government departments, they really are organizations of their own. They, they have large, large independence. They often have different systems. They, they act as independent organizations. And in order to further the vision of e-government, to further the vision of a unified citizen-led uh, digital experience for government, they are creating uh, unified marketplaces where every different department can publish their APIs. And, and the Smart Dubai Initiative is one example where they're taking this, this model. Then we get a, another model where we start to see a, the same thing, but we have, instead of, instead of a closed group where they have a, a single aim, we have a shared revenue model. So in other words, this is where we are trying to create a, a revenue stream for the participants by sharing in revenue that the API marketplace creates. 
And the idea biz example that I showed you earlier is exactly that model. So we have multiple parties publishing their APIs into a common marketplace and sharing in their revenue and from that. And finally, we see this concept of an aggregator marketplace. So an aggregator takes APIs from multiple parties and aggregates them into a new API product. And so this is where we can see somebody who is adding value to those APIs by pulling them together to create a new product that they sell on. And typically they share in the revenue in some way, either they buy those APIs from the back end or they do a, or they do an explicit revenue share. And this is uh, really what a company called Appagate is doing by creating uh, bundles of APIs for the telco industry. So all of these examples pretty much of, of that I've talked about of API aggregation and federation have been based on a WSO2 API manager. Uh, the, uh, I'll just be clear that Uber, uh, I'm, I'm not involved in Uber in any way. They, they aren't using this product, so I don't know what they're doing and, and I'm not trying to malign what they're doing in any way at all. I'm simply making a comment on the, that one picture. And what we've been doing is trying to understand, well, how can we take federation to a next step? And what does that mean for us? And what it means for us is, how can we enable uh, multiple parties to publish APIs from different platforms, from different vendors, from different systems into a single marketplace? And so we've been working with a, a group of, of like-minded people from different companies to create a, a kind of specification for that. Uh, and there's a, a GitHub repository for this. Uh, we have uh, fortnightly calls, there's a mailing list. And if you're interested in participating this, in this and in, in these concepts, uh, you're more than welcome to join in. So please uh, email me or, or email or, or join the group to do that. And, and uh, the aim here is to really try and capture these patterns in, in technology so that it's possible to build on them. And, and I also see, I've split those five patterns out, but I also think you can have combinations of those patterns. You could have a closed group with aggregation. You could have an internal marketplace with aggregation. You could have an internal marketplace with revenue sharing. So there's all sorts of different possibilities for these federation patterns. So I want to finish up this webinar with this one, uh, with this one quote which is a number of studies in the last decade have shown that ecosystems that have high biodiversity are also highly productive. High biodiversity means rich in variety of species. And what this really means is that creating these ecosystems and enabling multiple parties and multiple different technologies to share in them uh, is going to increase the productivity of your digital journey. So being more diverse, being more federated is going to create a more productive ecosystem. I'd like to thank you very much. And I think now we can take some questions. So there's a question here saying, how do we manage central aspects like security, tracing and logging aspects? In a, in a cell based architecture? So this is really a, a great question. And I think the, the answer to this is to integrate your, uh, your cell gateways into a service mesh. So the, the reality here is that we want those teams to be able to interact and, and work independently. And so if you read the cell based paper, what we're proposing is that the cell has its own control plane and data plane. And so, for example, within a cell, maybe you're going to use RabbitMQ or HTTP to uh, offer and control uh, security and, and systems. Then at the cell gateway, you may well plug that into a system like Istio or a service mesh and certainly you want to plug it into a centralized API management portal or marketplace and then have a kind of global control plane. 
and that global control plane is going to manage security tracing logging aspects across the uh, across the the organization so i hope that answers that question so i have a very interesting question here it says do you have ideas on road mapping from legacy to cell based microservices architecture absolutely so if you go read the paper on the cell based architecture uh, it certainly covers that aspect a lot and one of the kind of key aspects that we have in there is the concept of of taking a set of legacy applications or a legacy application and it, wrapping it as a cell so this is really something called the strangler pattern the strangler pattern you may have come across is the idea that you can take a legacy system and expose it and hide it behind apis and and then slowly migrate parts of that application to other pieces and it's named after a thing called a strangler fig that you see in uh, southeast asia and the strangler fig is basically a vine that grows up around the outside of a tree and eventually completely covers the tree and the tree dies and you're left with the shape of the tree but but created out of vines and so uh, i certainly suggest you read the paper because it has a lot more interest in there so the next question is is it possible to automatically federate two api management marketplaces and the answer here is kind of uh, yes and no so today if both of those marketplaces are using wso2 api manager then yes we can automatically federate so we can basically uh, take apis from one api management portal and federate them into another api management portal but the problem we see there is that of course people are using not just our portal and our gateway but they are using apogee kong tyke uh, and and all sorts of different systems and so what the specification the federation specification we're building is really trying to enable this automatic federation across different marketplaces whatever technology they're based on uh, through some extensions to swagger and over time we expect to extend that to cover things like billing and, and identity as well um, and we've also done some research on how that interfaces with blockchain so there's all sorts of interesting things going on um, in that space so i've now run out of questions um, uh, just give it a moment in case there are any others and if not, I would like to thank you all for staying to the end and, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your days to attend this webinar. The recording and the slides are going to be up on the web uh, shortly. And um, f obviously feel free to share them on, on your favorite social media platform. And if you have any further questions uh, or thoughts, you can contact me, paul at wsh.com, or you can message me on Twitter at pzfrio. Really appreciate you, your attendance and thank you very much and have a great day. Bye now.